Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Today, we kick off a more or less monthly program for 2023 called The Lost Cyber Highway, which will be a series that addresses various pieces of theoretical literature on the topic of cybernetics and anti-cybernetics. Our goal is to conduct a survey of both notable literature and rarities, which attend to the pronounced interest of ours here on Asset Horizon, which is the concept of the control society articulated by Deleuze in his postscripts on societies of control, but also a theme which, of course, has been expanded by some of our guests, such as Ian Allen Paul, Gerald Raunig, and so on. Now, with that said, we'll be looking at the work of folks like Sadie Plant, Stafford Beer, Takoon, and others as we probe a spectrum of views on the topic. And without a doubt, we will probably have much to say using the lenses of Foucault, Baudrillard, and of course, Deleuze and Guattari, as we proceed. Today, we will begin with a piece by Nikolai Fedorov, published, it says in 1905, but probably earlier than that, entitled The Common Task, which you can find in Accelerate, the famous or infamous compilation of chapters and essays on accelerationism put out by Urbanomic Press, which you should consider supporting as they put out a lot of worthwhile reading. But before we crack the accelerationist reader today, we need to make a couple of announcements at the top of the show. This year, we are continuing our ongoing reading groups for Deleuze and Gattari's A Thousand Plateaus, as well as George Bataille's The Accursed Share, which have all been a blast. However, as we wrap up ATP sometime in the late spring, we will begin a new reading group for Deleuze's book on Nietzsche and philosophy. That will take us until the end of the year. And also, as we continue our work with Zero Books and Repeater Media, we will be heading up a new reading group, which comprises the work of Mark Fisher and novelist William Gibson. We will be reading Fisher's dissertation, Flatline Constructs. And once we finish the dissertation, we will dive into William Gibson's Neuromancer, the famous cyberpunk sci-fi novel, which Fisher draws upon quite heavily in his work. So if you want to become a member of the former reading groups, that is ATP, the Accursed Share, and the upcoming Nietzsche and Philosophy Reading Group, join Acid Horizon's Patreon account, which I'll flash on the screen in just a moment. If you're interested in the Mark Fisher and William Gibson Reading Group, find us on the Patreon account for zero books. And wherever you're listening, there should be some show notes that I'll pop in, all the relevant information. And I also wanted to say that the moral support and the financial support is very important to us to help keep the show going. That said, we don't want to create any hard financial barrier for anyone who wants to join any of these groups. So if you're interested in hopping aboard, just find us on any of our social media accounts like Twitter, Instagram, for example, and I'll make sure that anyone who wants to get in the group of their choice can. And I also wanted to say thanks to everyone who supported us by purchasing something from my design shop, our merch store, or grabbing a copy of The Philosopher's Tarot, which I put out on Repeater Books late last year. Also, you may or may not know, we at Acid Horizon, this podcast, have an upcoming book with Repeater Books coming out in fall of this year. And perhaps I'll let it Adam and Will say a few things about what readers can expect. Adam, what's going on with that book? So the book is called Anti-Oculus, The Philosophy of Escape. And it is a kind of collective toolkit for diagnosing the various aspects of the control society in what we should call the, the cyberpunk present. There's going to be chapters on the formation of identity, both medically and sur surgically, and also legally, historically, as material practice and how it's controlled and regulated, not simply in terms of what one can identify as, who one can identify with, and how various apparatuses of cybernetic policing intervene upon the body into shaping its possibilities of experiencing itself. There's also going to be a lot of works on introducing a lot of cybernetic concepts using ideas like the thermostat as a paradigmatic way of understanding how things start to heat up in moments of revolutionary struggle. And also going through various interviews with protesters, as well as some anthropological and sociological work done on police tactics to understand how the state sees you as a warm body in the heat of revolutionary struggle. Will, what about you? Is there anything that you'd like folks to look forward to in the upcoming book? No, just <laughs> if you know me, it's, it's in that 
that same realm of the question of of aberrance and escape, right? So it's going to be in the the register that I think folks have come to expect from from at least like our general vibe. I I, I don't think it's a it's a remarkable break from what we've been doing, but I think it's been really exciting, especially because like. Some of us are more publicly prolific than others. You know, Craig, you're sort of the <laughs> the the face we associate with this operation so that we can recede into the background and do our little grad school nonsense. But honestly, like Adam and I have been a little bit more forceful in public with, with our writing. So it's really exciting to see, you know, what you've been working on. Because, you know, you bring a certain a certain interest to maybe the spaces or the zones of of interaction or even dangerously i'll say in- introspection that i think i i'm generally sometimes allergic to but i think the way that you talk about it is is pretty exciting especially if you remember a year ago we we were all talking about the image of thought quite a bit so the relationship between deleuze's critique of epistemology foucault's account of social control and police as a mode of organizing existence sort of intersecting or you know short circuiting some fundamental philosophical constructs that we've been dealing with or trying to neutralize i think it's exciting to see where we all ended up <laughs> with this really broad and complex interaction with the history of 20th century philosophy and the history of of police <laughs> So I think that that in that sense, it is an exciting project, not only because we're working on it, but because it's so pertinent to what we care about and the commitments that we have. So, yeah, don't expect don't expect anything that you wouldn't expect, I guess, from me, whatever voice I carry. But there certainly are there's certainly a lot of really exciting stuff ahead. And yeah, this, this series, box, I think, it's not a program. Right. No, it's not a program. So I don't you know, I don't say, you know. But yeah, I, I I think that what we're doing for the next few months with these texts will be pertinent to it. So I don't think that's separable. The work, if you can call it that, that we do here. We'll speak through through some of the text in, in that communication and through every single interaction. So like this episode will be a great indication of where of where I am in that. So yeah. Good. Yeah. And I, I think maybe for my part. What I attempted to bring to the table with the writing in this book is that on the notion of escape and the philosophy of escape, one concept that's, I think, very important is the idea of perceptibility becoming imperceptible and so on. And, you know, I, I found this book and in, in, in my contribution to be a way to sort of disentangle some of the tensions and conflicts philosophically that I had between various mediators particularly Deleuze, who will be a, a major figure in the book, and also thinking of Deleuze, you know, as a philosopher of refusal, maybe which ties in with what Ian Allen Paul said about Deleuze being an abolitionist, and how we can think, you know, some of the most brute metaphysical concepts and brute epistemological concepts that, that, that Deleuze delivers in the notion of the image of thought, and just the idea of an image, like what is an image? How... What does he pull from Bergson, for example? How, how is it, for example, that for Bergson and Deleuze, everything is an image, right? How do, how do we dispense with this notion of the imaginary, but perhaps reclaim it in a way, in the way that, that James Hillman does? So these have been sort of important personal questions that I've tried to extrapolate, you know, upon these other concepts that are politically important, like policing, imagining futures, and so forth. So um, some fun stuff to come. So... That's the end of our big advertisement for everything that we do here in 2023 at Asset Horizon. I hope that everybody maintains their interest and continues supporting what we do. With that said, let's move on to the primary task of today, which is discussing Cosmic Utopia, Fedorov's The Common Task. And it was Adam who proposed this episode. So maybe Adam can give some introductory comments about who Nikolai Fedorov was, what he's attempting to do in this essay, and then we'll go into some of the criticisms. So Nikolai Fedorov, so it's 1829 to 1903, just to get the basic information, 
out there was sort of a Russian, he's an Orthodox Christian thinker, particularly influential on the kinds of socialist transhumanist thoughts that comes out of the post-revolutionary period in Russia, uh, which we now call Russian cosmism or biocosmism. The idea of this maximally revolutionary, maximizing technology kind of thinking that was meant to transform the very human race's relationship to the earth and to work and to production. A kind of a, a fully automated luxury space communism before the term was, 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 was claimed, I guess, in the early 21st century. The reason I wanted to pick this text was because it illustrates the, the utopian desire at the heart of a lot of cybernetic thinking extrapolated to a universal project of management. Before even we get in the 60s, for example, we get architects, planners, designers like Buckminster Fuller putting out books like you know, an operating manual for spaceship Earth. So the common task of this piece is the task of essentially the total revolution of production of everything to do with our lives by turning the planet into an object of management, into a spaceship, this cybernetically guided, piloted, as against Greek, Kyberios, piloting. It's the same words in Latin equivalent we get for government as well. And here is where this, this text really laid, laid it all out, really. It lays out all the utopian ideas of technology, and it also lays out their inherent logics and limits. The idea of a spaceship Earth is a militarization of the Earth. It is the Earth taken as an object, as I said, of management and control. And I think here we can start to see from its incipient forms sort of where these tendencies in these great promises of cybernetics, the cybernetics movement, particularly around the post-war period, where sort of their latent limits end up, or where the, the darker side, the more biopolitical side of these cybernetic utopias can, can actually make its appearance. Yeah, I think this essay is actually quite strong as a starting point to discuss the idea of cybernetics and anti-cybernetics for a couple of reasons. I, I think primarily because it compiles a series of claims we have previously addressed with respect to the control society. But I think importantly, particularly with this essay, Fedorov peels back the discourse just enough to show us very explicitly what I think are many of these sort of millenarian and colonialist attitudes that remain precursors to the cyber positivist position. And so I think some of the things that I'm going to say about this essay are things that you might have already heard me say in our episode with Jim on Harlan Ellison's short story, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. And, and what I'm coming to discover is, especially against some other reading that I've been doing, you know, with Hillman and, and so forth, is that there's a prominent existential disposition of the cyber positivist, which is this quest for immortality and or the struggle against death as a human phenomenon. And I think those are the same thing, of course, but I think that latter articulation intimates some of the problems that are maintained in the view a little bit better. And so with that said, I, I, I still think nonetheless that it's worth attempting to steel man this argument because I don't think Fedorov had the benefit of living in the 20th century and seeing you know, many of the horrors that were visited upon the West and the rest of the world you know, in the form of totalitarian governments and so forth. Regardless, I think, I think this essay is particularly good because it, it, it centers upon some of the very things in a very sort of pure form, mm. the, the, the accelerationist position that we've, we've argued against in, in previous episodes. So I'll, I'll turn to Will. Maybe you have some opening comments about the essay too. I do. I, I think my opening comments are very simple. It's the common task. I think we have to focus on the question of the function of the word commonality and then the treatment of the term task. So there are two things that stand out to me here, which first, when it comes to the question of what the task is, the task is obviously the maximization of forces, right? And that's only possible insofar as we take up a new globalized understanding or biocratic understanding of the human terrain of the earth and sort of to inframe it in such a way as to, to produce it as inherently manageable. I think 
Adam's point about the millenarianism or yours about the the lurking millenarianism is really interesting because I think that one of the one of the key elements here that it's clearly toiling with is a sort of post physiocratic understanding of crisis, right? That crisis is not necessarily something that's meant to be averted, but to be managed. I think we can all speak to now in the post 9-11 era, at least Craig and I can speak quite clearly now about what sort of an intemporal crisis looks like. And I think that some of what has to be said about the impending doom of the human as a sort of species is fascinating in as much as it has to be produced in such a way. It has to be rendered intelligible first as a, as a mechanism to, to then be seen as something that's breaking down. And I think that Fedorov does this in the, in the third or fourth paragraph where he writes, the mechanic has appeared just as the mechanism has started to deteriorate. And of course, we can understand this when we talk about this as subjecting humanity to a particular plane of intelligibility, right? It, it's rendered intelligible as a mechanism, and therefore this mechanism is always breaking down. And this is one of the fundamental elements of biopolitical management, one of the fundamental principles of the cybernetic hypothesis. So what's really interesting about this text is that it's coming from the physiocratic tradition. I think we can make this clear by saying that like agriculture is the primary encircling topic of production here, which I think is quite fascinating. And it, it then is scaled to the cosmic level, which is, is interesting. So it's stuck between a physiocratic worldview, but one that can very clearly see the, the cybernetic management or like the government of security on on the horizon so that so that sort of bridges the difference between between the task which is in a certain sense not just transhumanism but a, li a little bit more complicated than what we we conventionally conceived conceived to be like a sort of a sort of human plus or a xeno humanism but then we understand that that's only really possible for fedorov if we take humanity as a sort of universal unitary mechanism with which we can sort of infuse or compound with all of these various new technological innovations. You know, he, he says, we don't even know, is it photo, thermo, or electro-powered, right? And sort of submitting the human being as a sort of manageable force. So I think that the question... The question of salvation, Craig, that you raise is really important, but I think one that it that I think I, I missed when I first read it, and it only became clear to me when you started talking, was uh, I'm not so sure he's interested in in immortality as such. I think he's far more interested. The quest of immortality is is the immortality of this productive vital force, which I think he submits metaphysically to the human being, and then and that the promotion of that metaphysic of, of vitality is the most important thing. And that humanity's sort of expansionary manageability is the source of its salvation, of this vital force's salvation, which I also think is one of the fundamental elements of, of biopolitics is that it submits its object to normalization, but it's no longer an individual body, but the entirety of the population. Mm. So I think that like, yes, sort of salvation and immortality are kind of these like lingering themes but I think that when we talk about immortality, it's a very particular kind. And I'm not, I'm not so sure if it's one that's, that's the, the, the immortality of life as it was understood by like Xavier Bichat or like the, the physicians of the 18th and 19th centuries. I think the, the life is really the, the, this, this administrative vital force of, of humanity, which I think we can probably get into like what that exactly is for Fedorov. But those are my initial thoughts. Yeah, I mean, even if he doesn't say that very explicitly, it's a reasonable inference simply on the basis that he sees humans as the creative vehicle for the, the creator. And of course, we can get a little bit more into that as we go. This text is short enough to the, and maybe unknown enough to where I think it merits us reading some of it. And so I thought I would just read a, a couple of passages at the beginning of this text, and then we could react to some of the things 
that he said. One of the things that I thought was interesting right off the bat, and, and Will already mentioned some of this, that the sort of basis of the organization of society would be this grand classless agricultural commune. And one of the, the sort of antagonistic aspects or drives is, you know, something that we find in Marx. And he never mentions Marx or capitalism specifically in this essay, but he definitely has this notion of a division of theoretical labor and manual labor operative in creating the kind of split that is keeping humanity from achieving the common task. And I think the derivatives of that, libidinally speaking, I think are very interesting and have a biopolitical dimension. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I, I also think it's kind of interesting, too, that in the creation of the commune, one of the things that he's calling for or heralding is the sort of dissolution of certain manners of contestation that then crystallize or coalesce in the form of a new kind of courage or, or, or moral virtue that's like a martial virtue. And then, you know, by doing that, we, we can come together and now it almost democratizes this notion of exploration, expanse. It kind of takes this colonial metaphor and puts a sort of democratic sheen on it. So I'm going to bypass the first paragraph and I'll just read the, the second and third paragraph on the first page of the essay. Fedorov writes, the prejudice that the celestial expanse is unattainable to man has grown gradually over the centuries, but cannot have existed ab initio. Only the loss of tradition and the separation of men of thought from men of action gave birth to this prejudice. However, for the sons of man, the celestial worlds are the future homes of the ancestors, since the skies will be attainable only to the resurrected and the resurrecting. The exploration of outer space is only the preparation for these future dwelling places. The spread of humanity over the planet was accompanied by the creation of a new artificial organs and coverings. The purpose of humanity is to change all that is natural, a free gift of nature, into what is created by work. Outer space, expansion beyond the limits of the planet, demands precisely such radical change. The great feat of courage now confronting humanity requires the highest martial virtues, such as daring and self-sacrifice, while excluding that which is most horrible in war, taking the lives of people like oneself. And so with that, we kind of get a flavor for not only the, the philosophy of Fedorov, but his sort of rhetorical flair as well. And so may, maybe, Adam, you want to, to respond to some of that, and we'll just kick it off. I mean, a democratic sheen is the, the most democratic you're going to get out of this text. I mean, I think it's, so let's just, just, just rewind and take it back to the, the core elements of this text. So what is the common task? The common task is to collectively organize all of humanity in a classless communal society, still with a lot of division of labor, of course, in order to pilot this spaceship Earth. Or, or to at least leave spaceship Earth to pilot it to be a launch pad, in a way, we're like an aircraft carrier, so we can go out into the stars, take other worlds, presumably unpopulated. Although it doesn't mention this, and he mentions one of the some of the lovely people we should emulate as being Cossacks, who, if you ask anyone else in history, were just a bunch of you know, not not the best people. People want to get on the wrong side of or particularly nice to minorities in, in the Russian Empire. So we can see, you know, there's one point there. And what makes this task so common? This common task of going out, taking the stars, and then developing technology to resurrect everyone who has ever lived? What is the base of this? Is it, is it a democratic wish? No, it's not that everyone is going to vote on this task because everyone wants to see their ancestors and everyone wants to live forever. Or no one wants to die permanently. No, the reason why it's a common task for Fedorov, and this is very clear on page 88 of the Accelerationist Reader, is that it's actually a moral duty. It is a moral duty. He says, we know that we are the offspring of a multitude of deceased ancestors, but however great the number of the deceased, this cannot be the basis for an incontrovertible acceptance of death because it would entail an abdication of our filial duty our familial duty, basically. Our duty to each other is to, well, predominantly to our ancestors, is to make sure that they come back. 
there were, and, and this is an inductive kind of conclusion, very similar to how Nietzsche talks about it in the, on the genealogy of morals, the birth of the concept of guilt as debt before a, a divine being. Because the more ancestors you get, well, the more you've got to resurrect, the more people there are, the more deaths there are, the greater the burden it is to resurrect as many people as possible. And this task is so common because in a way it is the collective debt. It's common in the sense of, you know, communia, in the sense of the munus, the debt, if we go to the Latin root of it. And this is really where the, the danger is picking up. It's not sort of a desire for immortality. It's a duty for immortality. And not only is that the moral imposition, there's also a secondary argument for this task. It is what in theology they call soteriological, by which it means concerning salvation. And it's really an argument against the idea of a transcendent heaven. A transcendent heaven, he thinks, has not stopped our societies falling into moral disrepair. It's, it is a moral disrepair. He says, so, and instead of this transcendent heaven, we need an imminent heaven. We need an, another world we can point to and say, okay, yeah, after you die, we're going to go to that world and we're going to build a resurrection machine on it, or we're going to establish the institutions of resurrection, kind of like what the Mormons do with their view of God having his own planet. And when you die, you get your own planet, for example. Um, and that's going to be the real goal. The real common task is that oh, actually we're going to make heaven. It's not, it's, it's a matter of scale, not a matter of impossibility. And that's why he says, so long as there are no real translations to other worlds, people will resort to fantasies ecstatic rapture, and drug abuse. Even common drunkenness is apparently caused by the absence of a wider, purer, all-absorbing activity. This is his idea of the meaning of life, which is to live forever. It is the idea of managing these populations, these, these criminal activities, these, I guess what he may view as the criminal world, like the degenerates. This common task is to be the unifying thing for which they're going to throw their lives so that they can get their lives in this deferred, but nonetheless materialist view of heaven. And it's, I mean, how is this not something like, you know, the, the Rocco's Basilic example, which is this stupid thought experiment a bunch of tech bros have, which is if we don't participate in building this great God AI machine, then it will punish us for not helping it because it's inevitably going to exist. It's that, but it's the other way around. You know, the tech pros think that their basilisk is in the future waiting for them and the debt is to the future to participate in it, whereas actually for Fedorov, the debt's in the past because it is this elevation of the ancestral debt into a universal obligation on humanity, universal human debt. Everyone has died for everyone else's sins and will only die for everyone else's sins insofar as death is still a possibility we are not collectively driving the entire planet to destroy. So yeah, just I, the theological aspect, just to highlight that, it's, I don't think it's particularly democratic text. A commune didn't even be democratic necessarily. <laughs> so Will, do we want to talk about social ills, lust, drunkenness, debauchery, and the other moral impediments that are preventing the achievement of the common task? Oh yeah, no question. I mean, like this is a remarkably Protestant text in a very, very specific way. Like this, this... This is space Calvin. He wasn't Protestant. <laughs> to me, this is this is this is a remarkably Calvinist understanding of the function of work, which is essentially that, like, to not work, and these will just be like the words of Calvin, is to test God, right? But in this sense, like, to not work now is to test not only one's ancestors in the past, but one's ancestors in the future. So. The purpose of humanity is to change all that is natural, a free gift to nature, into what is created by work. Which, of course, like we can talk about the function of the figure of the creator, which I think is really important in as much as we don't understand. I don't think he, Fedorov ever makes it clear how the creator works temporally, which I think is a really important concept. But all of these things about, about drunkenness or, you know, these various forms of social ills that were, of course, like, the focus of population management in Europe in the 19th century manifest now as sin in relation to what they, what they promote, which is fundamentally idleness, right? Which is an existence without why, which in the end, I think fundamentally puts forward a serious economic challenge that in the face of a mode of governance that takes like Malthus seriously as like 
the as the fundamental problem facing humanity, which, of course, again, like Fedorov doesn't have the 20th century to reflect upon in this in this essay. But I don't think I don't think it necessarily matters. I think one of the things that that gets lost here is, again, the the production of of work, both as inherent to human nature and fundamental to human nature's salvation which I think is a really interesting thing, creation of, of both an ethical practice, but something that is alienated in a psychological sense, not in a, in a 19th century psychological sense, not in a Marxist sense, alienated from, from human existence. And I think Nikolai Fedorov makes this clear with a really strange ontological claim at the end of the essay where he says thought and being became distinct, right? Mm. Th- that thought and being becoming distinct is fundamental to what the purpose of work in a human ethics, where where work and thought become singular, is where salvation lies. And the reason why salvation lies there is because, again, humanity's expansionary manageability and the promotion of productive forces is salvation as such. There's no threshold. There's no threshold. There's no final, final unitary space. In some ways, there's like echoes of Joseph Smith, right, where we get to become gods over these new over these new expanded worlds but again in the end it's it's that the solar system itself has to be transformed into a controlled economic entity and that might look extremely promethean right of the human being gazing out at the solar system and attempting to sort of either render it intelligible or you know make it operate as a machine but what what fedorov does that's really interesting is like no in fact what is needed First is a kind of multi-unity of the the human of the human species. Like all of that remains mm-hmm. remains achievable imminently to how we register how we how we register systems of control within the human being. So all that's achieved so long as human manageability is is maintained and expanded. So I I, I think that it's a very specific kind of kind of a kind of recursive Prometheanism. That I think is necessary. We have to dive into the the biocratic depths of human management, and in doing so, then cosmic biopolitics or cosmic the cosmic utopia is immediately is immediately present. So that's what I have to say. I think one of the ways this text is interesting. By the way, if anyone who's listening is a graduate student or a community college teacher, like this is just a fantastic essay. I think to use in your like your rhetoric course or intro to philosophy course or for so many reasons. And reading this, it kind of took me back to my days as an undergrad, as somebody who once identified with Christianity, but was in some sort of nebulous space where I wasn't anymore. And then hearing for the first time this idea of totalizing discourses. And this, in so many ways, is probably the most pronounced and paradigmatic example of a totalizing discourse. It's almost parodic in a way. And, and I, I want to talk about that because I think one of the ways that we can see the common task as a sort of moral task is as an immunization of Christian salvation. And the way that he articulates it runs directly against the work of Bataille. And, and, and I think that that's interesting that this particular work finds its place in the accelerationist reader because Bataille, in some sense, is a mediator for a lot of, of those thinkers as well. The idea, for example, and, and here are just some interesting ideas that, that we didn't talk about in the sort of pregame, but I, I would like to sort of unpack a little bit here. This idea, for example, that the history of ecstatic religious fervor, collective non-productive expenditure, rapture, divine experience, can in some way be chalked up as failures of the collective will to translate a a certain will into its productive capacities. So those libidinal energies that were released or achieved in in the experience of, you know, an ecstatic festival, whether it was a religious one or, or a carnal one, was a failure. Why? Because we couldn't put that energy into making our homies immortal right? (laughs) Or bringing back our ancestors. I only thought about this a little bit, but there's a way in which all of that is kind of metaphorical. It's symbolic of the notion of the fall. That is, if you accept the sort of subtle ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny argument that I think is embedded in all of this is, we have a teleological 
intention embedded within all of us to, to achieve the common task. And it's only due to moral degeneracy that we're unable to achieve it. And so what is required is a kind of moral intervention to put us back on that path that we, each one of us, makes our life into a moral paragon of sorts so that we can go about colonizing new solar systems and putting ourselves in Mars and sending a Tesla Roadster into the sun. It's not a very Christian text, is it? It, it is like the idea of this, there is no expenditure here. It's not like some of the utopias this text would go on to inspire. So, for mm -hmm. example, I mean, thinking about this maximization of forces, harvesting everything, basically conquered death, unknown plenty, although this plenty is primarily an agricultural plenty for Fedorov, one can't help but think of someone like Ian M. Banks' The Culture Series. And the idea of yeah, anyone, anyone who's read the culture will see this sort of post scarcity, post mortality kind of society, and it's about how it goes through that. But Fedorov, it, it's 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 almost like you can't actually navigate it because it's so fundamentally a duty. It's it's a, it's a transaction with one's own ancestors, and I think this is probably so austere because of the kind of of, of theory he's reading at this time. And I think we should definitely hone in on the fact that Fedorov is a Malthusian. So mm. Thomas Mal Malthus writes his essay on the principle of population sometime in the early 19th, late 18th century. It's the idea very influential upon people like Darwin, actually, that there's only a certain amount of food, the population gets too big, it exceeds its ability to sustain itself, everyone dies, so you need to get population at manageable level so that there aren't famines. And there's, this is ultimately a moral argument. It's actually good for people's souls to have this. And it's applied to human populations on a genocidal level. The most, and you know, we don't need the 20th century for Fedorov. We just need to look at what the British did in Ireland. It, it was a famine entirely artificial. They had them out, they had the food. They just wouldn't sell it to them. And it was entirely justified in Malthusian principles. This is why Jonathan Swift wrote his book, A Modest Proposal. So him joking, but presenting it as if it was a Malthusian derived economic tract that the, that the Irish sell their children to aristocratic British people to eat them so they can get money to buy food. I mean, this is the, the population management of the 19th century is, and the 18th century as well, is thoroughly built into Fedorov's text because Fedorov says, and let me just get the quote regarding Malthus here. It says, necessity of such movements is self-evident to those who dare take a sober look at the difficulties of creating a truly moral society in order to remedy all social ills and evils, because to forego the possession of celestial space is to forego the solution of the economic problem posed by Malthus, and more generally, of a moral human existence. So he's looking at something like the famines, the artificial famine, justified on Malthusian grounds. And what he's saying is, is that we need to go into space because Malthus is correct. He thinks Malthus is correct. And that's why we need this surplus, this huge humane surplus so that this problem is resolved or fundamentally there is always going to be an excess of food because we have turned the entire so you know, galaxy into an allotment. Well, I think most probably in a, fact, a collectivized factory farm, a coal cars before the coal cars, let's say. And I just want to sort of point out how weird it is for, Fyod for Fedorov to be a Malthusian at this point, because Malthus isn't really popular in Russia. And Malthus is projected for being too much of an English austere kind of figure. And there's a great essay, which you can, this is, you can find online for free. It's on Libcom. It's by Stephen Jay Gould, the evolutionary biologist, and it's called Kropotkin Was No Crackpot. And the idea is that people used to teach Kropotkin in like, you know, history of science courses as being this very fluffy, ideologically motivated critic of the harsh Malthusian aspects in Darwinian theory. And actually, Kropotkin is actually quite standard for his time. A lot of Russian evolutionary thinkers do think Malthus is wrong and they don't think about their populations as a scarcity because Russia is, its wilderness is so much bigger than the human populations compared to the very restricted, well, these prima facie restricted size of the British Isles. 
which wasn't actually the case. You could still feed everyone. So this 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 Malthusian affirmation of Fedorov's is very weird for the time in Russia. Kropotkin is making observations along this anti-Malthusian line before he becomes you know, the the prince of anarcho-communism. If anything, I mean, I, I joked that he wasn't a Protestant, Will, but it's a very Protestant way of thinking that's coming. This is a this is a Protestant theology. This is to quote David Bentley Hart, it's the vision of God who, if anything, is more evil than Satan himself. I, I think that too, like just looking at the history of the development of the risk and danger within social management, like it's inseparable from the alterations that we see just like I was posting selections from from the history of madness. Some of the changes in the Lazar houses, in the general hospitals across Europe, Germany and France, you know, the, the arrival of, you know, physiocratic, physiocratic articulations of grain regulation is occurring, you know, only a couple decades after, you know, occurring only a couple decades after mass changes to structures of social welfare in France and Germany, and especially England. Like, uh, for example, like Quenet's economic tableau, right? Fundamental to, to physiocratic thought, to what, what would become to known as like raison d'etat in Foucault's later lectures. Like, this is only, <laughs> this is only like a hundred years after the beginning of, of, of the generalization of confinement and the opening of workhouses, which are still, you know, one of the more fundamental, one of the more fundamental elements of punishment in our societies, right, is, is basically unwaged labor, which does not have necessarily, necessarily the output of, of competition on a product line in, you know, in textiles in England in the 17th and 18th centuries. In fact, sometimes it's better that it doesn't, right, because then it doesn't impact like Danielle Defoe's critique is that it impacted the the share of moral upstanding citizens their ability to have access to the market but the function that it had was to reinsert humanity into what into the common task of work right the goal of human activity which is the production of the world as something which can be returned to the creator right which can be returned or given over to to ancestors whom you have a debt to a debt to both in the future and the, and in the past so I think that in, in, in a certain sense, like, yes, I, I guess I can say that it, that it has that sort of a Calvinist, a Calvinist separation of the function of works, right, and of, and of working as such. But it, it also carries with it like a very, especially if like we're reading Malthus as like the primary interlocutor with Fedorov, it, it also has, it also shares in material developments that were occurring in Europe at the time. And we're now just like, standard practices by the end of the by the end of the 19th century and we're starting to even evolve then so i think that you know in some ways fedorov is still interacting with the shift of a perspective of historical time that's no longer one about you know the imminent catastrophe of the last empire but now the necessity to produce an indefinite political art because the end of the world is always materially around the corner because the nature of governance is crisis. So like a, a, a rearticulation of what historical time is in its indefinite nature, but also in its indefinite crisis is, I think, one of the things that, that, that Fedorov is toiling with. Like, what is the first sentence of this, this piece? It's that we're squandering our vital potential, right? It's that it's completely squandered. And what is, what is the goal of the, of the workhouse in the 17th century? It's to allow the individual to come back into contact with what? Their vital forces in relation to the common task of humanity. Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, like it's it's very material in its relationship to historical processes that were occurring. And this is kind of not just a late echo of it, but it also is able to see out into the kind of total mobilization of human forces that make World War I possible, right? That make mass trench warfare possible. So, so you're saying I, it's kind of like a, a project for like humans like their usefulness, kind of like their, their instrumentality, a kind of a, a human instrumentality project, would you say? Sure. I, I wanted to dig into some of the weirdness of, of this text. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed in both of you for not 
picking up that thread of the ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny piece, which if you haven't heard that phrase before, it simply means that the, the individual organism of a human being in its own development essentially lives out or unfolds in an evolutionary way. So going from infant to adult, we see the, the evolution of the human being. Beyond that, does he believe that we could actually grow new organs? And here's the thing, I'm so Deleuze-pilled and so Deleuze-brained that I wasn't sure what he meant by organs at first, but he's actually talking about spleens. He's talking about pancreases. He's talking about lungs. And I think what he's suggesting is, well, if we weren't orgasming so much, and if we hadn't had that fifth of whiskey, we'd be on our way to developing a new sort of like regulatory organ that would allow us to live in sub-zero temperatures. He'd be and a semen retention tweeter today. He totally is. This is a total male fantasies candidate. I want to read just that paragraph, and maybe we can talk about that. He writes, of course, we cannot know what the world was like in the beginning because we only know it as it is. However, judging by the creator, we can to some extent presume or imagine what a world of innocence and purity could have been. Could we not envision, too, that the relations of the first humans with the world were similar to those of an infant not yet in control of his organs? So, so here's my argument about ontogeny, right? Who has not yet learned to manage them. In other words, could the first humans have beings who should and could, without suffering or pain, have created such organs as would have been capable of living in other worlds in all environments? but preferred pleasure and failed to develop to create organs adapted to all environments. And these organs, namely cosmic forces, became atrophied and paralyzed, and the Earth became an isolated planet. Thought and being became distinct. And so th there's his reason as to why we have a split between theoretical labor and manual labor. Man's creative activity in developing organs corresponded to various environments was reduced to feeding and then to devouring. Fedorov is basically saying is, is because we become libidinally invested in these ways that are non-productive, that we are expending ourselves in libidinally degenerate manners that we have not moved ahead along our intended course in a way that would satisfy our creator. Well, it seems like the big, the big enemy in the room is, is non-productive expenditure. And for that reason, we should just pass it off to Adam. But <laughs> because he's the best at it. This idea of the prelapsarian potential of the human race is, this answer is, is, is an idea which is very common in literary circles in the West, at least in the late 19th century. We have the, the, the book, The Coming Race, uh, which actually has nothing to do with coming, turns out, but has everything to do with energy expenditure. And it has this idea of the really are race. And they have real energy, for which in Britain we get the term for Bovril. And then you have these Nazis picking up these ideas of Hyperboreans and their fuel sites. And this idea is very popular in the 19th century, trying to do kind of a historic sort of anthropological account of the fall. And this idea of, yeah, we could have used our organs something different, but thought and being were severed. This, this is an attempt to give an anthropological account of the fall. And the idea that we, we don't know how to use our organs, so we use them for pleasure. I mean, you have to imagine then what, for, for what purpose does he think we're going to use our organs when we fulfill the common task? What are we going to do when we've all come back? Because not everything will be, we have completely taken away all the senses of individuality that would allow us to have, or any sort of, you know, a sensuousness that allowed to have a collective feeling in the first place. Any sort of subjective aspect of the ancestors becomes lost because the ancestors especially as the, the common task goes on, is infinitely more abstract. This hatred of productive expenditure is, I mean, it, it is just heresy, isn't it? I mean, from any Christian perspective, this is kind of like, you know, the, 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 it, it's this very transactional notion. It's kind of like the evil. There is a bit of productive expenditure in the way of a god that shows up, gets nailed to a bit of wood, and then dies. There's kind of, there's not exactly, it's not exactly cyber sin, is it, for fulfilling the desires of the entire human race, even by a Christian's own criterion. So this, this idea of the, the organization of a body being somehow futile to its purpose is also part of this transhumanist aspect of, I mean, you can even see it, for example, in some parts of xenofeminism. You know, if nature is unjust, change nature. And Fedorov was quite notorious for hating nature. 
he thought it was, you know, if anyone who praised it wasn't out in the cold and he wasn't out on the harsh rush of winter, and that's fair enough. Mm. A lot of people can wax romantic about nature and then not see, you know, how, how harsh it is. But overall, it's this weird juxtaposition of nature and man and this weird kind of Christian rationalism where man's job is to translate all of everything into an object of work. He even says this, and this is the, the most Calvinist aspect really is, the spread of humanity over the planet was accompanied by the creation of new, brackets, artificial organs and coverings. The purpose of humanity is to change all is natural, a free gift of nature into what is created by work. New artificial organs and coverings. We can think of them as organizations, but also think about a hand becoming a texting machine, a writing machine. These are new, they're new organizations of the body for these ends. But one cannot also help but think of the recent David Cronenberg film, Crimes of the Future, which has Viggo Mortensen starring as a man whose body just keeps growing new organs with no specific use. And he, what happens? He gets them cut out and presented as an artistic performance. You know, the tagline of the film is, surgery is the new sex. You can see crimes of the future. Whose future is it? It's Federal's future. The idea that we have these autonomous abilities to play the plasticity of our bodies rather than leaving it to solving this ever-increasing debt. And because this debt is ever-increasing, I mean, to not have the same optimism as Federal means that this, this is just as transcendent as heaven. Because heaven is meant to be transcendent as opposed to Federal seven, where it's just going to be material and realize eventually, you kind of have to give up any kind of transcendence of, of the divine here. And not in any imminent sense, because it's not going to be there either. It is this millenarian, it's it, the, at the end of the world coming. It's more or less like the Left Behind series, but backwards. Kurt Cameron might have been a Russian biocosmist in a different time. We don't know. Yeah, I think too, though, the, the, the other thing you were saying about like, what exactly does he think? Does he think these organs, whatever like, he means by that, that can remain contestant, exists for uh, once the task is achieved? I think the brilliance of the common task is that it's unachievable, right? It's fundamentally unattainable. Like it is just a task. It's a task with no threshold which is why, you know, it's demanding an indefinite political art. And it's an art that I think, like, in some ways is crucial to modes of neoliberal governance, right? The arrival of human capital as a mechanism of understanding, of understanding investment and value potential. I think that, like, I think that when we talk about, like, things like the biopolitics of disability, a lot of what would become fundamental to how we understand concepts of ability in the in the neoliberal financial sense from Gary Becker exist kind of here in the in a strange sort of infancy which is why i think that there's this sort of interesting connection between the sort of illegalist of dissipation who squanders his his own being rather than like the luddite who blows up a factory the illegalist of dissipation is the figure, the drunkard, or the man who goes out and, you know, wastes his life, wastes his existence, and the individual who squanders their human capital, right? Which exists sort of in casual conversation too, right? We're still having this discussion about like, you know, if you weren't building 15 different drop shipping operations during COVID, like, you know, what human value do you have? So like they exist sort of casually, but like the eugenic core remains... I don't want to say consistent because I don't want to lend it a sort of transhistoricality that it doesn't necessarily have. I, I just think that there's a kind of interesting connection between absolute terror of the drunkard, right? Like, why is it that the drunkard is the, the idol is always the fundamental problem that, that exists at, at this moment of, at this moment of, of, of the shift away from a, an, an account of historical time that is fundamentally apocalyptic towards an account of historical time that is always in crisis. And I think that that in some ways, that's what makes this text fundamentally cybernetic, is that it, it is a strange, it is this new, it's the first sort of echo or whisper of a sort of new account of historical time in crisis, a new kind of end of the world that is always, always happening, always around the corner. And the goal is to, is to sort of manage perpetually this crisis. I think it's interesting that we've, we've landed upon talking about the drunkard as the figure that's the most detestable in Federoff's view and framework, which actually leads me to what will be probably one of my final comments about this text is the sort of imaginal 
or psychological dimension of of this kind of thinking psychological precursors and biases which motivate not only at the individual level but at the collective level this sort of demand that we actualize some sort of internally productive society and this is going to go right back to what i said during the harlan ellison episode which is i think there is a very fundamental denial of death and a resistance to a being towards death that we see not only in Fedorov's philosophy, but in a, in a lot of accelerationist philosophies, Nick Land's as well, I would say especially so. And I don't know, I, 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 I fall in with, with Hillman here, but death is something that, that we live with as an always already coming to pass of all that exists. And I think the way that it connects to this figure of the drunkard or someone who's intoxicated or in ecstasy is that death, when we talk about our death as an individual, we're dead, boom. However, there's an imaginal dimension to it, which is that this idea of death means our dissolution. And I think our resistance to death as an imaginal figure is partly responsible for what has produced some of the greatest horrors in history. And I think the collective psychic disposition of a culture that avoids or masks death will be forced to encounter it nonetheless, often with these confusing or devastating consequences. The illusion of death not only dampens the subtle enrichment of a life lived alongside death, but it can also belie the reality of life that wills its immortality and the real sacrifices humanity and its victims have endured in the denial of death. And so, like I said, I, I stand w with Hillman here because I, I think, and I know Will's not big into the psychology aspect of things, but I, I'd like to broaden this notion of psychology to the imaginal being, you know, this sort of collective disposition that involves beliefs, practices, institutions, and so forth that resist the possibility of death. And in so doing, create these kinds of compulsions. And I, I think if a culture, a people, a discourse, a language, a text, in some way, shape, or another does not bend itself or apply itself or make an address of the inevitability of death, I think we, first of all, we rob ourselves of the potential of that desubjectivating counter movement that I think is necessary to achieve the kinds of freedoms that I know all of us believe are important here on the podcast. But I also think that it just flies in the face of, of reality, that death is imminent. Well, what's interesting about death is that Fedorov believes it's an inductive conclusion. It, the logic of death as a certainty is not something he sees at the horizon of our experience, but rather that, well, everyone who's ever lived has died. And therefore we abstract from that into a general law. Then it, it reminds me a little bit of the, the Neil Gaiman's The Sandman, mm -hmm. where you have Pop Gadling. So Def and her brother, Dream, are in the tavern at one point, and they overhear this conversation where Pop Gadling is sick. They said, look, Jill, I'm never going to die. It's a mugs game. Jill, mm -hmm. People just die because everyone else does it. But I think it's a complete ripoff. And then Def makes a bet with Dream and says, I'll make this guy immortal. And then we come back every hundred years and see if he still likes it. And this is kind of what Fedorov's gambit is. He's incredibly terrified of, of his own death for a man, I, feel, I believe was a man of the cloth. So it's, again, it's a very weird shift from this transcendent heaven to, you know, we need to go and build kind of thing. And it's the idea of, I, I think Fedorov, I don't think anyone can fault Fedorov for his imagination. Going to the imaginary, I think there's a really good aspect to, at least, to writing a text like this. And we've been very hard on Fedorov for good, for good reasons, but the idea of things being what they are never had to be that way. You know, we can mm. change nature, we can change necessity. And thinking about the figure of the drunkard as a sort of ultimate idleness, I mean, in the context of 19th century pre revolutionary Russia, the state did own, you know, had a state license to do what it liked to proliferate this to keep people down. I can sort of see that. There's definitely a strain of Russian radical anti-totalism, anti-alcoholism that goes into that. And of course, you have the famous posters in the Soviet Union, the guy saying yes to a 
a glass of either rakia or vodka or something. But he, there is an aspect of this we should take on with us as we go through all this, which is the idea of yeah, challenging necessity. Or at least maybe challenging it in the way that the people have read this text as challenging necessity. I don't think he is challenging necessity as much as most people think he is. I think he's just affirming a different kind of necessity that he thinks is latent in how he sees historical time on a theological and not biological level. But I know I think this is why I think Federov was such a good guy to start with in terms of thinking about the cybernetic the idea of managing the entire planet, the idea of management tools, management concepts coming out from their very roots as secularized, or even not even secularized, as materialized theological concepts or theological imaginations, and what the economies of those imaginations brings to the table. Got economy, of course, or economia as will will possibly align with it, is a Christian concept. And the infinite economy of the world, as Agam Ben says, is a Christian theological notion. That's hell. And this kind of seemed, this kind of seemed actually quite hellish because you couldn't even get out of it. Once you're resurrected in the common task world, can you die? Or is it your duty of all of your friends and your family and everyone around you to keep you living perpetually? Can you choose your organs or do you have to have the right organs lest we you know, forget how to maintain the resurrection? It's all the resurrection machines actually are not doing it for us. Oh no, we suddenly made Am from Hull Ellison's I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Because it's not allowed to die there either. I think in the end with Fedorov, you get just an incessant stream of family reunions and five-year plans. <laughs>